So uh, please feel free to interrupt by unmuting uh, yourselves. Um, so this talk is uh, about uh, mobile uh, perception, uh, mobile uh, visual recognition. Uh, here is a video taken from a toddler who has a camera on his head. Uh, this video the, aims to show us the dramatic variability of visual content, the dramatic scale changes, a big TV, small TV, becomes very big when we go close. Every image is very difficult to understand what's happening. Now you're going to see a shoe. Uh, so, so single image recognition is also very hard. We realize that we really need to integrate a visual information over time. Uh, and essentially, we're just trying to show the challenges uh, for recognition from videos, where the videos are not actually you know, directed from a human director that has zoomed on the actor or a human photographer that has actually you know, taken beautiful pictures and showed them on the web. Um, and uh, somehow we humans uh, and animals, um, importantly, are very, very good uh, to handle uh, the challenges of, of, of visual data, of mobile visual data. Because the brain has very strong ego stabilization mechanisms. And um, not only the human brain, but actually uh, a lot of animals as well. And despite the camera motion, we always have maintained a stable model of the world. Um, and, and this is what we're also looking after to do in our research. How can we get videos and, and build those stable models? Okay. Um, and uh, so there are some uh, problems with uh, CNNs, at least vanilla CNNs, that if you just apply a visual recognizer at every frame, the objects come in and out of the field of view. So objects disappear when they get occluded or when they leave the field of view. You don't know when the camera is moving and when the objects are moving. And uh, the objects change size. And they don't change size because actually in the three world they change size because the camera comes in and out. And this is not surprising. Nobody would uh, think that using CNNs uh, makes sense for visual recognition. Now, the interesting thing that LSTMs also don't absolutely make any sense for visual recognition under a moving camera. So this is we're going to see in a little bit and explain why. Uh, but basically, the big challenge is that uh, what you see in a video is an entanglement of what the 3D scene looks like and how the camera moves. OK, so there is this entanglement problem. And we, we oftentimes try to, we don't talk about this problem because we, we care about static image understanding. In fact, the biggest success is since 2000. Uh, 12, but even before with DPMs, right? They were on static image recognition, recognizing objects in photographs that humans have taken those photographs. So, you know, you're not going to see some weird shoe, um, right? You're going to see some nice shoe uh, with a human on top of the shoe and everything's going to be nice and contextualized and it's going to be easy to recognize. But but the robotics people that, that actually have been uh, hunting mobile agents, the robots for some time, they, they've spent a uh, 30, 40 years on, on SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping methods. Um, and I just showed here a video from Orb SLAM 2. Of course, there are also more latest versions of these algorithms, but this, um, this one state of one of the state of the art. You see the nice point cloud map of that scene. And what you see in blue is the camera, the camera pose at every time step. So you see the camera trajectories. Okay. So what did Orb SLAM 2 here? Took lots of pictures of that scene and made a stable point cloud map, 3D map of that scene, and also estimate camera motion. And yes, there is object permanence. You saw that teddy bear, that teddy bear was not there in every frame. Uh, so indeed, SLAM tries to do this disentanglement, separating camera motion from, from scene appearance. But what does SLAM, what, what is that SLAM cannot do that humans can do and animals? Well, SLAM cannot do a model completion, which means that SLAM methods cannot predict what the camera cannot see. And here you see this office scene, and you see the camera has been literally everywhere to make this nice dense map. And if you go to thousands of those office scenes, next time you go to an office scene, again, you need to go all over the place. You will never be able to learn to associate a 2D view with the full uh, 3D map of the scene. The, the, the SLAM doesn't care about that. He says, I'm just going to move the camera around. And this is not what humans do. Humans move around quite a bit when they're young, but then we don't need to move around to, to see the world. We just open our eyes, see a single view and understand what's happening. We can do a modal completion. We can imagine 
what's behind the occlusion. Um, I don't know if you guys agree uh, with this, but it, it seems to be true. Um, another problem with SLAM, which is a smaller problem because we can make everything end-to-end -end differentiable nowadays, we can, from a point cloud map, we can also spit out something, is that it does not optimize for the right end task, which is moving around, recognizing the world, moving around in the world, just cares to do 3D reconstruction by the projection error. And yeah, trying to, to, to think that first we need to do 3D reconstruction of the world to you know, develop intelligent agents may not be the right intermediate task. Here is Rodney Brooks, who in 1991 said that um, internal world models that are complete representation of the external environment, they're both impossible, impossible but also not necessary for the agents to act in, in a competent manner. Okay, so, so now we have two separate sphere line of works. We have end-to-end -end visual learning from 2D images that care about recognizing objects, detecting objects, recognizing them, building semantics. And then we have the 3D methods, 3D computer vision that just cares about 3D reconstruction. Um, yeah. And um, the question is, uh, so, so, so in this talk, what we're going to see is how can we use 3D and those ego stabilization mechanisms as an inductive bias in deep neural networks. Okay, so we're not going to care to find awesome 3D reconstructions. We're just going to pull this bias in the bottleneck of the neural architecture uh, to be able to integrate information in videos and so on. And the second thing we're going to talk is what are the applications of those networks uh, in object detection and training, learning intuitive physics and uh, grounding language from few examples. So basically mobile computer vision brings challenges, but also opportunities. Uh, what we're gonna show is brings also opportunities for learning visual representations without a lot of human annotations, okay? Uh, so the ability of moving around and understanding what you see by moving around. Um, so geometry aware recurring networks. Uh, this is an architecture we proposed in CPR 19. Uh, this is Fish, who is the student behind uh, this work. Uh, and what uh, these networks do, well, they do two, two, two new things compared to previous neural architectures, let's say CNN. The first is that their latent state is three-dimensional. So by three-dimensional, I don't mean X, Y, and time. I mean X, Y, and Z, okay? So you have 2D images, but the, in the, the heart of the network is building a 3D feature map of the environment. Um, and the second is that as you get more and more images, then you really need to be estimating your ego motion if you want to fuse these informations over time. And essentially it works like this. So here is a video sequence around the coffee machine. And what we do is first we take that image and we put it in a differential model in a 3D grid by I'm projecting. And this you can do it both without depth and with depth. If you have depth, you're gonna take every pixel and put it in its corresponding uh, the three degree location. If you don't have depth, then you're going to shoot that pixel along the ray. Uh, and then the, the CNN is going to clean up that, that mess that you're going to make by those unprojected, like casting rays all over the place. Um, so here, and then, you know, you're going to have your 3D convolutions. And, and the 3D convolutions now, you're, you went from an image to a dense 3D feature map. So after unprojection, everything is sparse. It's just a, a surface that you have on your grid. But the 3D convolutions will take care of densifying that, that 3D space. Uh, and then here is another image, and you do exactly the same thing, but now you need to estimate the rotation and translation. How has the camera moved between the previous frame and the current frame? And why you need that? Well, now you can transform your map. You can account for camera motion, and then you can dump it and fuse it. And here is another frame. And again, you're going to make the surface, you're going to densify it, and then you're going to fuse it. Um, so the idea is that you get, you have that three frames and you know, the camera is moving, but here is the point on the coffee machine. And that point changes, of course, X, Y location because the camera is moving. But in the 3D feature map, it's always on the same place. And why this on the same place? Because this scene actually doesn't move. It's only the camera that is moving. And because you actually subtract the camera motion, then what ends up being there is something 
is a stable 3D scene, basically. You try, you try to do what SLAM is doing, to try to separate camera motion from the scene appearance. And you distill the scene appearance in those 3D feature maps. Uh, yeah, so by the way, these 3D feature maps is our choice for the 3D representation. I mean, people use meshes or point clouds or voxel occupancies, and we think the 3D feature maps are the most general thing. You just say the network, just you have 3D space and just put whatever features you like. Now, if you have water and then uh, you, you're going to figure out to put features so that I can decode that it is water. And if you have this super weird wiry object, again, you're going to do the same. Because if I'm trying to put meshes or points and you have these very weird structures, I mean, maybe things are, are harder. Uh, th that's all. Now, point feature clouds also could, could do potentially, but, but then you should not be using convolutions. You need to be using point convolutions and then learn how to densify those point clouds going from a surface to a full uh, scene. Is that uh, maybe clear or um, this is the architecture. Now we haven't discussed what we're going to train them for those GRNNs, but basically the, the short answer is that you're going to train them for whatever you train the CNNs. Um, here we're explaining why putting convel STMs and so on is a bad idea for video recognition. Here's again the same image sequence. You have convolutions everywhere. Here is the hidden state at t, t plus one, t plus two. Uh, here is the point on that coffee maker that moves in the x, y space. And because you don't account for camera motion, convolutions are just not enough to do this eco stabilization. Now transformers potentially are better because they try to search for correspondences and maybe implicitly they try to do some stabilization. But again, um, ex having explicit 3D feature space where objects can sit, uh, persist, like it's behind my head now, not override one another. It's just so convenient and intuitive. Uh, that's why we're using it, okay? So what are we going to do now? Are there any questions, by the way, so far? Uh, I have a question. So mm -hmm. between times, uh, between different uh, frames, uh, do, how do you aggregate the data? Is it like a recurring network that is aggregating the data or you just like, yeah, great, Thanks. great question, great question. Uh, so what this picture shows is like, you have the feature map, you estimate 3D rotation and translation, you transform the feature map, okay? So now at least the previous feature map and the current are on the same coordinate system, and then you do whatever you, you like. Actually, we have put 3D GRUs there, we have done averaging, then you can put your favorite learning-based fusion equations like LSTM and so on, but at least first you need to make sure that the coordinate systems agree. But yeah, you can do whatever you like there. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. by the way, averaging has also, for, for whatever I'm going to show, averaging worked as well as LSTM and was five times uh, faster. Now, of course, a good question would be, how would this recurrent network change if we had moving objects? So I'm going to get to this at the end of the talk, but basically the idea is that you need to have such a feature map for every object, every moving object, keeping track of its location in the scene, Keep, and so on, and updating it separately. That is the short answer for, for this. So it's a recurrent network with a very special structure with a lot of domain knowledge regarding camera motion. Um, yeah. But by the way, recurrent means that you repeat the computation at every time step. It doesn't need to be like that. You can also, you know, have a history and look at the history and decide how to uh, convolve or fusion and so on. Um, but, but does this answer your question? Yeah, thank you. yeah. Okay. So yeah, I've got a question as well. Okay, sure. Uh, what is the resolution for this 3D space? Because I know it takes a lot of memory. Uh, yeah, it takes a lot of memory. And we use the biggest possible GPUs with 32 gigs. And uh, we do, and it's hard also to use sparse convolutions because you're supposed to be predicting what is occupied, what's not occupied. Well, if I had a, how to say, if I had a, point cloud and I just had to process and detect objects that I could use parse convolution because I know what's occupied was not occupied here. I'm trying to do the prediction problem, right? The completion. So I, it's harder to use parse or at least we have less gains. Um, yes, so uh, the, the answer is uh, we use uh, whatever higher resolution we can allowed by our GPU memory. Now, one thing that I want to remind you is the following. At every grid location, it's not a binary value zero one. That would make the representation horrible. You cannot see anything if you discretize uh, in that resolution. 
Every grid holds a long feature vector, and this is what saves the fact that you have lower resolution. Now, having said that, when we track, we do zoom at every different objects and, and do essentially um, zoom in, zoom out all the time for that feature map so that we're not, uh, how to say, uh, limited by the resolution. That's one thing you can do. The other thing we're investigating is adding implicit functions at every voxel uh, so that we can have very accurate rendering of what happens around that voxel. And the other thing that we're investigating, but this is not part of the talk because it's our ongoing work is to completely forget about like whole centric scene feature maps and only focus on the objects and uh, two very sparse operations very early on. Uh, but, but you will see that what we're doing now, uh, you know, it's essentially we're doing inverse graphics, right? We tried it from 2D to 3D. And, and you don't need to solve object detection to do it. You just take the full scene convolutionally and dump it here. And this is actually extremely convenient for many applications. Um, because inverse graphics in the current uh, format assumes that first you need to detect the objects and then you need to unproject them and put them. So it assumes that you need to solve a very, very difficult problem beforehand, right? Excellent to the object detection, which is not solved yet. Uh, so here we're going to show how we can do it differentially and convolutionally. But yes, the problem of the memory is, is there, absolutely. And, and what in practice did you use? Was it 16 by 16 by 16? No, no, no. It's like something like 100 by 100 by 100 by 64 or something. Uh, by 64, okay. By 64 is the feature of strength. And yes, yes, this is what it okay, was. So it's still a decent resolution. Yeah, yeah. well, we have batch size one and accumulate gradients and there are tons of problems. And we are trying to get rid of these um, with a lot of different ideas, but we haven't managed yet. Mm -hmm. Great question, great question. So what are we going to do with those? I'll tell you a boring thing that you can do is you can train an object detector. So this is going to show later in the slides. But the most exciting thing you can do with those networks is you can train um, visual representations just by moving around, exactly like Pulkit, um, uh, Professor Pulkit Agragal had, put that, had made that paper a few years ago, learning to see by moving. So again, with this architecture, again, you can learn to see by moving, essentially by, you know, you move around, you try to guess, I give you a query viewpoint, so you know the viewpoint, and I ask you how things will look like there from that viewpoint. And you're like, okay, let me try to think. Let me orient my map to that viewpoint. Let me project it down and decode it into an image. Let me now compute error without any annotator. I don't need any human to do that. And let me back propagate the error. Okay, so by view prediction, you can train this network. Uh, now, we all know that uh, regressing to pixels is a very difficult problem due to dramatic uh, stochasticity uh, of the visual world, um, right? So, so, I mean, it's useful for graphics applications, but it's not maybe potentially not useful for uh, learning visual representations. However, let me show you how learning view prediction is not a new task. Tons of papers have tried to do it, including the GQN, Generative Query Network of DeepMind. So, what can a model with a 3D bottleneck do better than another model also trained for view prediction, also knowing camera motion, okay, also knowing camera viewpoints, but without such a 3D bottleneck. And by the way, here, no depth is used during a projection. Well, I'm showing four examples. The first row shows two objects. So I train on two objects and then I test on two objects. And the other three rows show four, four objects. So now I, I train the model only on two objects and I try to see, can it generalize to four objects? And the 3D bottleneck eff eff essentially effectively generalizes. Um, by the way, when I say 3D bottleneck, it's not just the, the 3D latency. You also need to do this ego stabilization thing that have you asked, how do you fuse the maps? You really need to, to do this job, but, but you know, you know ego motion, so why not to do it? While the other model, still sees two objects. There is no reasonable generalization or maybe out of the training data generalization, they call it combinatorial generalization. So, so having a good representation of space can get you a lot, uh, can, can, can give you great generalization ability beyond your training data. Let's put it this way. Um, okay, so, so by the way, there are some artifacts if you play this GIF long time. Uh, now the problem is, uh, so are there any questions so here, by the way? No questions. Um, yeah, so let's see. Now, can, uh, can we learn good visual representations by predicting views? What we found is that uh, predicting, generating beautiful pictures and learning good visual representations may not uh, or work for the same objective. 
Uh, in fact, we found that if we give up on generating images, but rather generate uh, feature abstractions of those images. So we, when we do the rendering, we don't spit out 2D images, which is width by height by three, but we spit feature maps, 2D feature maps, width by height by number of channels. And then we estimate such image feature maps bottom up from the query viewpoint, okay, again, with another 2D CNN, concurrently trained, nothing is pre-trained. So you train this from what we call, let's see, so this is the 3D version. Okay, so I don't have the name, uh, but the name is called contrastive uh, metric learning. Okay, so if you do that, then you can learn uh, better, better features, meaning features that correspond better across semantic categories. So this is the 2D version, but you can also do a 3D version of that uh, contrastive loss. Let me show you how it works. So you take your target view, and instead of spitting out a 2D feature map, you lift it to 3D and you correlate voxel wise the features. What does this mean? It means that Corresponding voxels better have more similar feature vectors than any non-corresponding voxels, a standard contrastive loss function. So if you do that, uh, actually here we have it uh, better. So you find the corresponding voxels and here is green because they're corresponding and here is a negative, uh, negative pair. And you wanna make sure that the Euclidean distance of the matching feature vectors is smaller than the Euclidean distance of non-matching feature vectors. And all the tricks of how do you sample negative examples apply here, like the same thing for any contrastive learning program. Um, and, and here is the features that you learn. Look, they follow the cars. And um, actually, we have a whole paper about uh, the fact that tracking emerges in 3D by looking around in static scenes. So this is in ECCV 2020. So it shows that just using this contrastive prediction, you can track the objects in 3D by doing ransack to those features. So you take the features out of your encoder and uh, you have the car and you try to estimate this 3D translation and rotation over time. And actually you do decently well and you do better than uh, dense objects. Now, let's say you try to find correspondences only on the visible parts of the cars supervised by triangulation. I think a big benefit of those representations is that they're 3D. So the full car is there in frame one, the full car is there in frame two. This makes it easier to match as opposed to having two separate views of the object with random occlusions, each one of them and try to figure out, oh, what is the common thing between them? Um, and, and here, this shows that if you use this contrastive view prediction, as a pre-training objective. So you pre-train and then you train object detector on top of that. I'll, I'll show you what, uh, here's an object detector. So just a mask CNN, but instead of taking an image and spitting out 2D bounding boxes, it takes a 3D feature map and spits out 3D boxes and 3D segmentations, voxel segmentations. So basically this few contrastive pre-training will give you better 3D object detectors than predicting images. Okay, and of course it's better than weight, random weight initialization. So this is not surprising. It's just what we wanted to see here is, is predicting images the right objective or contrastive features will give you better representations. And the answer seems to be that contrastive features will give you better representations in photorealistic environments. Um, if it's too toy, the environment, view prediction and view contrastive heaven don't have like a day and night difference. Um, yeah, so one, one other thing that uh, you can see about the power of estimating camera motion is here is a scene where both the object moves and the camera moves. And this is how the 3D feature map looks from the overhead camera. It looks pretty messy, right? But, but look what happens. Take two frames, infer their 3D feature maps. By the way, this coloring comes from doing PCA on the feature vector. So you keep the three components and you map them to RGB value because there's other, no other way to visualize those maps because they're four dimensional. Okay, so why you see 2D is because we, the feature dimension is condensed to one color and it's overhead, we just show the overhead. So you see that by stabilizing, by essentially subtracting the ego motion, what moves mostly is the, the moving objects themselves, right? And you see that the car, also has a little bit of completed background, whatever is missing from the current view, because the whole point of a CNN is to try to complete that car. Okay, so basically, if we manage to find a better architecture to better completion, we think we'll do pretty pretty well. It seems that uh, object-centric is pretty important, but, but this is another story. 
So basically, you can do moving object detection without any annotations, just by estimating optical flow on that stabilized space and seeing, okay, which object proposals have high optical flow and no motion in its surroundings, called center surround score. I want lots of motion inside, no motion outside. And the important thing here is that nothing else is moving. The only moving thing is the moving objects because you have accounted for camera motion. You have stabilized, okay? So whatever camera was moving, you, you accounted for it and you, you subtracted it. And uh, yes, you, you can show that you can do decent moving object, moving object detection without annotations, basically. Um, and the question is, uh, we can detect objects. I mean, there are many ways you can detect uh, objects in 3D without a lot of human annotations. Other things is take to the two maskers and proposal and triangulate them and try to aggregate and so on. But the question is, can we do something more? Can we organize uh, the visual world just by moving around? Okay, so here we're going around the data set. And can we find things that repeat? And can we estimate their 3D poses also? So here, for example, we found those sofas. We say, we don't know it's a sofa because nobody has given us labels, but we know it's the cluster, cluster 33 in orientation 40, and then the other is orientation 20, and the cluster 34 is the pillow, for example. Okay, uh, so, so this is mainly what we're trying to work on right now. So I'm gonna just show some preliminary results. Um, we detect objects uh, by triangulating to the proposals essentially and, and so on. And to try to cluster those objects in that 3D feature space. And when you cluster them, you take into account rotation and scale. So the different rotations of the paper should go to the same prototype. So your rotation, we call it rotation aware clustering and scale aware cluster. So the same prototype, which I'm here, I basically I rendered so that I can show it to you. This looks like a paper. And here, this looks like cars and so on. The, the prototypes themselves are 3D feature maps, okay? Object-centric 3D feature maps. And yeah, basically what happens is you go around the scenes, you look at the scenes from different camera viewpoints, and then you try to cluster the objects in that rotation aware manner. And everything is that in that 3D feature space. And then you can render those prototypes to see what they are. And the way this is done is, uh, yes. And then you can run your detector and annotate objects using their poses based on what cluster it is. Um, and now we can do few shot concept learning. You can go and label one broccoli and then I will know what are the other broccolis and in what other poses. So you don't need to annotate their poses. I'm supposed to learn how to estimate pose, how different prototypes relate to one another on my own using those 3D feature correspondences. Um, yeah, so the truth is that there is some iteration between improving the detector and um, quantizing these 3D feature maps into prototypes. And um, we call it pose-aware quantization or essentially pose-aware clustering. And then, you know, mining more correspondences across different objects and using metric learning and the contrastive metric learning, not only within scene that our view contrastive loss function was doing already, but also across different scenes using these hypothesized correspondences. Um, so the idea is, is something that everybody wants to do. How can we organize the visual worlds into prototypes without annotations? So we think 3D representations may help us a lot here because when you correspond in 3D, you don't correspond partial views of objects, you correspond full objects. So it's, it's much easier, at least you ask for your matching match all those features to all those features. And this straight away gives you, um, you know, lots of constraints. Um, yeah, let alone that those features in 3D space do not suffer from foreshortenings and all these artifacts that the 2D images suffer. So they're gonna help us essentially bridge the gap between Mac 1 and Mac 2 and cell phone 1 and cell phone 2 and so on. Um, yeah. So, so, and you can do this also, of course, in, 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 in real scenes and go and find objects and distill them into different prototypes and then detect those prototypes from single views. So as you do this learning, then a single view should be able to run the detector, match the prototypes and so on. Um, yeah, so these are preliminary results, but this is our, uh, the thing that we are most uh, we try to do how we can continually learn 
prototypes or visual objects and parts by moving around. Uh, yeah, and this is exactly what I told you that we think the 3D feature space may be, may be very helpful here because it's easier to estimate correspondence in 3D than in 2D. Uh, another thing that we looked at is the following. Can you detect a green pepper if you have seen a red pepper? So far, with whatever I showed you, you cannot. You just have a feature map of the red pepper and a feature map of the green pepper. And these features, and they're going to be a little bit different because their style is different. Okay? So this 2D to 3D process essentially disentangles images into their objects in 3D and poses and the camera view. But the question is, can we disentangle even more? Can we take an object and try to say, oh, this is the style and this is the content, for example. And, and we'll do this in 3D. So this disentanglement, uh, I mean, is very popular. M many papers have been written on, on disentanglement. And here is one, uh, a recent one we like, multimodal and supervised image to image translation from NVIDIA. And it uses adaptive instance normalization as an inductive bias. And this is exactly what we're going to use in our networks. But we're not going to do it on 2D images. We're going to do it on 3D. And given a single view, first I'm going to lift in the 3D feature map. So I'll be able to see that behind that thing, it's a full broccoli. And then this 3D feature map of broccoli, I'm going to decompose into a content map and a style code. Now, the content map is not going to be a binary occupancy. It's still going to be a four-dimensional feature map, but it will encode mostly content. And uh, yeah, so you do this using this. Uh, uh, here is your feature map that you separate into content and style. And now you can cluster content and cluster style separately. Uh, so if you do that, so if you do that, then you can learn from very, very, very few examples. And we said, okay, why don't we try to do visual question answering in Clever using those disentangled 3D representations? Uh, detecting objects, by the way, is a small part of the language grounding problem. Okay, so it's not only about objects, it's also about adjectives, red, orange, green, shiny, and so on. It's all about spatial relationships, left of, in front, and so on. So can disentangle 3D representations allow us to learn to ground language, detect concepts with fewer uh, examples? And the, the, the answer is uh, yes. Because now I'm going to learn object categories over my content prototypes and style categories only over my style prototypes, over my style codes. Okay, so I'm not going to try to detect red or shiny over sh on that shape, but rather on the style. And I'm not going to try to detect cube or pyramid over the color feature, but only over the content feature. So here's an image it comes in, I parse it, and I detect the different objects. And for every object, I can estimate its 3D bounding box now, and I can estimate its content code and the style code. Do, do you see? This is what our architecture can do. It can take an image and disentangle it into 3D object boxes and each one with a content code and, and style code. And then you have your prototype libraries of shape and style. And then you say filter shape broccoli, and then you try to, to see Okay, which of those objects is the broccoli? Let me try to see. I can also rotate and estimate the pose of that broccoli. So if you say, oh, the bottle fell, then you can learn the concept fell on 3D pose. And you can do exactly the same for um, locations. So the relation to the left of or right of and so on will only sit on 3D locations. There is no reason to add color. The left of the concept has nothing to do with how objects uh, look like. It only has to do with their spatial arrangements. And in fact, we had a paper before that we really failed to learn robust in front of, behind, left of, right of, in 2D space. It, it's just it's so hard to get it to generalize. But in the 3D space, it's trivial to detect those concepts. In fact, even just um, some logic operators could get you there. So, so the 3D feature space is hard to get out of the images. But once you get them, it's trivial to use it. Uh, it really helps on, on, on detecting some, some specific uh, concepts, for sure, special uh, arrangements is one of them. And the style here comes again. Uh, we have a um, filter shape. Why we have the style here? Uh, yes, we tried to find the color. And then we have found the object, and we tried to figure out, OK, which, which color is that object that we detected? By the way, you, you use exactly the neural symbolic concept learner that came out of um, MIT. but instead of 
uh, here are some visual results. Instead of we use the same programmatic structure and in fact we compare with the NSCL and actually we also build a disentangled version of NSCL where every 2D bounding box is disentangled over style and content. And yes, the 3D version can do much better from much less example, 10, 25, 50, 100 and so on. Um, of course, uh, deciding on which feature every ling language concept should sit on is a problem on its own. We showed on that paper that using contrastive examples, meaning, oh, these are to the left of this is to the right of this, and now it's to the left. Well, because nothing else changed other than the special relationship, the agent can cast attention and realize from just a single contrastive example that yes, this is the relevant feature. And actually it's interesting, but children also do the same. They use explanation-based learning to cast attention to the relevant features. They don't use one million examples of left foot off and right off and, oh, let me try now to understand that, oh, the color is irrelevant because I learned from one million examples of left off that I should abstract away from that feature, okay? Um, yeah, I mean, this is good now. On the other hand, contrastive examples are much harder supervision than just annotating crowdsourcing. We need to teach like a, a child. Um, and, uh, Mm -hmm. So, by the way, are there any questions so far? So we have a question about the spatial queries on the yeah. question learner. So you have like all this 3D rich structure. I'm, I'm wondering if like that allows you to like, is the spatial query something that you learn or it's something hard coded because you actually have the... Yeah, so yeah. what is hard coded that also you can learn from contrastive examples. What is hard coded is actually oh, you only need to use the XYZ locations of the objects. But after that, there is a neural network. You just feed them into a neural network. And by the way, this is also hard coded in other works that learn uh, spatial expressions. They say, oh, we're gonna use only the bounding boxes of objects, for example. So, so we all hard code in a way, but we never make it explicit. I think this is very important. The feature selection stage is very important. It's just our features in 2D images are so entangled that the only thing we can separate is maybe, you know, appearance versus bonding box locations, but, but doing super fine grain, uh, disentanglement and feature selection, like looking at the one part of the object only and not on the rest and so on are super, super important for, for saving on annotations, so let's say. Um, yeah, so the truth is that uh, because it's 1244 and I really want to talk about our intuitive language, intuitive physics work, I'm not gonna talk about our, uh, what we've done here more on language comprehension. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so learning intuitive physics. So this is a problem that I like very much. Uh, actually, we had a paper on this um, a long time ago, uh, 2016. Uh, this is one recent paper on intuitive physics. The, 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 the idea is very, very similar across many papers. Uh, you have an image, you detect the objects. You, you want, first of all, the, the problem is you want to figure out how objects interact. And you apply forces on those objects and see how they move, how they interact with the boundaries of the BR table, how they dropped on top of one another when you push them and so on. And, and then you compare your trajectory predictions to the ground truth prediction. So on the left is the ground truth and on the right is the prediction of that specific model. And, and, and really the models do not differ that much because they all do some form of object factorization. So they detect the objects and then they kind of encode their appearance in some way. And then they feed those features into a graph network, a graph neural network. Um, every object is a node and the edges are between nearby objects or between every object densely connected. Um, and, the, and the problem is to predict object motion trajectories uh, in 2D space, okay? And I actually really love uh, the particle work uh, learning physics using particle interactions uh, from your lab uh, that, that also try to learn intuitive physics, but on, not on object level, or rather on a particle level. Now, the main problem here is how to get those particles out of images, right? Um, as opposed to use them ground truth or use them those, uh, you know, encoders of images to particles that go through fully connected layers and, and you know, they cannot generalize across, across scenes. So, so we're looking into these particle-based representations as well. Um, so, 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 so since you've done this work, you, you know, and actually these are our results from long time ago, 2016, 
uh, they don't look as fancy. But the problem is that, um, yeah, in 2D space, there is no object permanence. The objects can occlude one another. And, and not only that, but whatever physics you're going to learn under one viewpoint, they're not uh, going to generalize to a different viewpoint. Okay. While we know that physics, how the world works, has nothing to do with which viewpoint you look at it. So this is a very useful invariance if you could build it in your model. Uh, right. So in the same way, convolutions brought us invariance across, uh, you know, translations uh, in the image. So the same statistics happen in different places in the image. Here, when I say, you know, physics happen under any camera viewpoint. So of course, it's much easier to learn them in the 3D space extracted automatically from, from the 2D images. And those 3D bottleneck networks do this by construction because they don't operate on their images. They operate over 3D feature maps. So very, very easily, we're going to do a minor change over our old paper. And instead of detecting objects in 2D and try to estimate their interactions in 2D, we're going to actually first unproject the image and make a 3D feature map and run a 3D object detector to those images. And this 3D detector, by the way, generalized very well because it's much easier to detect things in 3D space than in 2D space because there are not many cross-object interference. There's a free space. There are a lot of hints. And, and then um, every object becomes a node in that uh, graph. And, and then we run graph convolutions or message passing in that, in, that, in that graph. And we predict how objects translate in 3D and rotate in 3D. And then what we do is we can unroll that network over time. And the reason that we're not going to suffer from error accumulation is because we do not need to be updating the appearance frequently. We can just use the first time step. Take the appearance of the object from the first time step and just rotate and translate them using the cumulative predictions. Uh, because the object appearance in 3D remains constant under such rigid interactions. Uh, it should sup it's supposed to be a very easy problem to learn physics of rigidly booming objects. Um, and, and here is uh, how this uh, uh, is, you see, essentially you see an image, you see a, a gripper moving around, but you have the imagination of 3D what's happening. And, and now, essentially, um, here you can imagine how things fall. You can predict exactly very similar dynamics, no matter what viewpoint you choose to view the scene. And you can train only on two objects and generalize on multiple objects uh, as well. And you, what are your baselines? Well, your baselines is a model that does the same thing from a 2D image space. And in fact, we found that, yes, if you don't vary the camera viewpoint, that 2D, that 2D model does as well as our model. Uh, on capturing physics, but as soon as you change the camera viewpoint, things break. Um, okay. Yeah. So another model, of course, is a model that forgets. We call it the XYZ plus graph. So you forget about object appearance. You just have a very impoverished 3D representation. And uh, it's also doing uh, worse. Uh, yes. And we actually are very interested in investigating your particles here. Instead of having object nodes, we want to have um, particle nodes. So, so this is a uh, work in submission. Um, and, you know, now you have a robot and you look at the scene, you can detect the objects in 3D and you can push around any way you like. You can change the camera viewpoint and so on. Uh, and, and, and in general, we are interested in using this type of uh, forward and inverse models in that 3D feature space because it's easy to generalize across viewpoints and, and across objects. So, uh, in concluding, I want to mention, to go back to what uh, Javier had asked, what happens when you have multiple objects in the scene. Well, in that case, every object is its own 3D feature map. Uh, you can track them. Uh, is something, it's a very much like 3D uh, tracking by detection, but the additional thing is that you have a visibility uh, reasoning uh, module that tells you when to expect objects to be occluded. So you should not trust your detection but you should be trusting there your forecaster, your 3D motion forecaster, okay? And, and you can, this is the cater data set that was you know, proposed for testing about object permanence, and you can learn when an object carries another, which means you to go on top of that, and so on. Yeah, and, and in general, we're very interested in capture learning those intuitive physics 
uh, not intuitive physics, yes. Well, watching videos and, and trying to understand intuitive physics and these things, you know, can work also on more complicated uh, real scenes other than cater. Um, and, and yes, this is, so this is the things I wanted mostly to discuss about today. Uh, how can we use 3D in ego stabilization as inductive bias in deep neural networks? Uh, yes, and uh, 3D representations can help tracking objects through occlusions, visual recognition and organization without human annotations, spatial reasoning for, for language understanding, and predicting object dynamics and, and hopefully manipulation. And of course, the only thing we care about is how can we get those representations to work from monocular images and videos without any depth input, uh, using actually non-metric type of 3D again representations. Uh, yeah, so, so this is the thing that, that we're, we're working on. And, um, and we also try to find synergies between this work and your particle uh, physics prediction. Um, these are the students that worked on the projects that I mentioned, and these are the published papers that I mentioned in this talk, if you want to take a look. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to leave a lot of time for discussion and, and questions as opposed to me presenting different papers from our lab. So thank you very much. And please, uh, you know, let me know your questions. Thank you very much. Do people have questions? We have time for five minutes for questions. Hey, Katarina. Hey, uh, Philip, how are you? Good. Really, really nice talk. Um, I think the 3D feature maps are really compelling. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on these implicit representations like NERF that have become popular recently. And, you know, what are some advantages or disadvantages between that and a 3D feature map? Yeah, yeah, great question. So this implicit is that uh, these functions that you feed an XYZ, uh, essentially, uh, yes. So, so the truth is that these yeah, representations yeah. Uh, do not uh, generalize uh, exactly because they have the fully connected layer, they don't generalize. Uh, there's been three concurrent papers trying to add implicit functions in every voxel. So again, the convolutional nature uh, of those three feature maps allow them to generalize across scenes. Um, and yes, actually we're, we're using those now. We, we, instead of having just a grid and every grid to hold the feature vector, and you want to estimate the feature vector in a sub-voxel location by trilinear interpolation, instead you could be having those implicit functions. And you're going to be way more accurate, hopefully. And, and the resolution of the 3D grid will not be such problem. But, but again, um, without such convolution, uh, then these things do not uh, actually uh, generalize. They, they can be learned very well for a specific scene. Uh, I mean, I know the continuous neural scene representations, they try to learn hyper networks of those, of those, on top of those functions. Yeah, but for example, you will never see this generalization from, oh, here is a scene with two objects, here is a scene with four objects. In fact, they only use scenes with a single object. Uh, or this nice nerf thing, the super, super complicated scene, I think they build it for a specific scene and they fine tune it and then they are able to render pretty amazing images from any camera viewpoint, right? But but I think whatever you learn in one scene cannot be generalized to another scene. Uh, does this make sense, you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's my impression too, that they're very scene specific. Um, yeah, but, but and they're, I think they're very, uh, yes, they're scene specific, but and, and they're, they, they, they solve the graphics problem. Oh, here's a scene I have, you know, few views, maybe 50, how can I render any view that I care about in a very compelling manner? Mm -hmm. But but as I said, we have added those implicit functions in voxels because we think it's going to help resolution. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, I like but, it. But I this like is a great question. Making it hybrid. Um, yeah, thanks. I have one silence. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go, go. I, I didn't have a question. Oh. <laughs> so it, it's a pretty specific about one visualization, but when you show the top-down view of the cars on, on PCA space, uh, mm -hmm. the sky is not being shown. Is that because you're using dev and like those voxels are not filled, or because the model learns to just like 
put like zeros where there's sky? No, we just cho chopped uh, we chopped the map at the particular height and, and showed it. Oh, so okay. this is you manually chop in the height that you like and yeah. I see. Okay. I have a brief question as well. When you're doing most of your work, do you assume like ground truth camera poses? Um, yeah, so some some works so so in the ISLR 2020, we tried to estimate these camera poses. In fact, we spent uh, one year and a half trying to learn some good camera pose uh, network. With And our effort was essentially take state-of-the-art optical flow, PWC net, and try to use the same things for camera motion estimation with 3D convolutions and course to fine and so on. So there we showed results also with estimated camera motion. Well, it turns out that uh, the slum people have better camera motion estimation. So now we're back to point matching and uh, ransack essentially. And and actually in our latest uh, works that I, actually I didn't have slides to show, we tried to jointly estimate camera motion along with, okay, where are the moving objects and, and so on. But in the tracking experiments that I show where the objects are moving, okay, so this there the camera was not moving, but it can also handle camera motion. And the camera motion was assumed known. Doing this with concurrent estimation of camera motion uh, is actually a very, very important uh, problem. And I guess like with the feature maps that you generate, do you find that that's a better representation for estimating like relative pose? Or uh, actually, no, like In, you a, a very good question. And no, you cannot actually share that much of the, uh, of the, of the bottleneck for view prediction and camera motion. It turns out that the camera motion estimation problem needs to focus on different features than, than view prediction. So you train it on its own supervised and self-supervised by generating synthetic data and so on. Uh, okay, but but yeah, the camera motion estimation problem is, is very important. But, but and we try different uh, ways. I mean, let me tell you one way we're trying right now. Uh, instead of taking a full scene and try to figure out 3D rotation and translation, we look at every object. Every object will vote. Uh, because it's so much easier to estimate the camera pose per object. And then, you know, we try to aggregate and optimize and uh, yeah, that makes things a lot like of sense. that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, so I was wondering about that um, that tracking um, work. So, I mean, effectively, what you get out there is scene flow, right? Yeah, a great question. Great question. So, scene flow is estimates motion between point clouds. Do you agree? Uh, um, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, three D. 3D or sort of, uh, I, I see it more as a 3D variant of optical flow, but I guess you can, you can say motion between point clouds, yes. Right, but here's the thing. In these, in these 3D feature maps, the biggest chunk of the scene is actually not visible. So when we estimate motion, for example, for the mo object segmentation work I showed you, we call it 3D imagination flow. Because you're supposed to, for example, now I cannot see the back of your head, but because I have completed versions of your head in my memory, I will try to match even the thing that I cannot see. So a lot of things happen in my imagination so that when I have this complete motion field, potentially I can segment your head as a whole as opposed to only the front part. Um, yeah. So and, and does, does that, like, I guess, does that help you get better 3D motion estimation for the things that you do see? Great question. Uh, no, I think the things that you see, you can do that accurate just by doing uh, your favorite thing. But for example, what it helps you is you can segment objects better because you don't just segment surfaces. Another thing you can do is you can correspond things better because uh, look, this is my cell phone and now it's moving and it's very hard to match this and this, but because you have the, a model feature map, you know, the completed version, then it's, you get less surprised in out of plane rotations. Now, of course, is 3D feature map the only way to do a model completion? No, I don't think so. Maybe a view-based representation would also do it. I'm actually not 100% sure about that. Uh, but now we use 3D feature maps. But does this make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Cool, thanks.